Hello, I'm John Donahue, professor of law at Stanford Law School, and I'm happy to welcome you today to this League of Women Voters of Palo Alto discussion by Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. Uh, in 1644, John Milton gave his impassioned defense of free speech, and uh, today we have with us uh, the, the modern day champion of free speech, uh, with whom I have always felt a, a great deal of um, sympathy in the light of the fact that we've had a, a similar path in many ways. We were both born in 1953. Both were moved by the civil rights movement to go to law school at Harvard. Uh, we both started our teaching careers in uh, the city of Chicago before moving to uh, California with uh, Dean Chemerinsky uh, going to USC. And we both uh, had our, our sojourn back to the East Coast for a while when uh, the dean went back to uh, uh, Duke to be a professor of law at Duke before returning to California in really one of the most remarkable episodes in the legal academy where he became the founding dean of the University of California at Irvine Law School and in an astonishingly short amount of time turned it into a world-class institution which anyone who is knowledge about uh, the legal academy or the academy more broadly knows that's an incredible accomplishment. So we're very fortunate to have a, a person of this eminence. Uh, as of last July, he became uh, the dean of the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and I'd like to go through his incredible uh, CV. I commend you to go online and print it out. It's 72 pages long. <laughs> Uh, he, Erwin has written 10 books and over 200 articles. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has been named uh, the single most influential person in the legal academy, all done with an astonishing commitment to justice and public service, not only in the United States but around the world, uh, and uh, all done with a, a remarkable sense of compassion and humility. Virtually everyone who's ever met Erwin remembers him with a smile. So I'm very happy to uh, uh, introduce uh, today's uh, America's John Milton, Erwin Cherminsky. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. I wish my mother could be here to listen to that. <laughs> it's really an honor and a pleasure to be with you. I've often felt that every generation feels that it's the first to really discover sex. <laughs> Likewise, I've often had the sense that every generation of college students believes that it's the first to really discover protests on campus. But the reality is that free speech issues have existed on college campuses as long as there have been universities. Yet I also have the sense that things are a bit different now. In part, our image of free speech on campus was shaped by the Berkeley free speech movement in the 1960s. That was college students wanting to demonstrate on campus about the ability to engage in speech activities that were unrelated to university administration. It was the administrators who were trying to suppress their expression. Today, often, it's outsiders from the campus who want to use the college or university as a platform. It's people like Richard Spencer or Milo Yiannopoulos, or Ann Coulter, wanting to come onto campus. It's often outside groups that are trying to stop them. There was an incident at the University of California, Berkeley, in late January 2017, where Milo Yiannopoulos was scheduled to speak. The radical group Antifa came onto campus and committed acts of vandalism. The then-Chancellor Nicholas Dirks believed he could not assure the safety of students, staff, and faculty and prevented the speaker from being able to appear. I think there's also a change now with regard to student attitudes concerning free speech. When we think of the Berkeley free speech movement of the 1960s, we imagine it as a time where students were unanimous in their support for freedom of expression. Now there's much more uncertainty among students. A recent survey by the Pew Research Institute of undergraduates found that 40% of them favor restricting offensive or hateful speech on campus. In part, this reflects very laudable instincts. <clears throat> this is the first generation from a young age to be taught that bullying is wrong. They've internalized that message. But I also worry that it's a generation that doesn't realize the history of free speech. 
that doesn't recognize how important free speech has been for all of the advances in civil rights in American history. I realized that for the current generation of college students, the anti-Vietnam War protests when I was in college, or the civil rights demonstrations, was long ago to them as World War I was for me. I also think that things have changed just in the last year. I often have a sense that we've turned over a rock in our society. And what's come out is ugly and expresses things that we haven't seen before in public. You'll remember in August of 2017, there were demonstrations at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. A white supremacist group held a rally there. I'm not sure if you've actually read the signs that were held up. One sign said, and I quote verbatim, kikes belong in the oven. I'm 64 years old. I don't ever remember seeing a sign with those words held in public. We had an incident at the University of California Berkeley Law School in September. Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz came to speak. He's controversial. He's an outspoken supporter of President Trump. He's an outspoken supporter of the current Israeli government's policies. His appearance went off without incident, though it was certainly tense. That afternoon, someone drew a swastika over his picture there was on a poster on a law school bulletin board. I've been a professor for 38 years now. Never been in a building on a campus where someone drew a swastika on the wall. So all of this is the context we're talking today about free speech and civic engagement on campus. I've increasingly come to realize that in talking about this topic, it's important to separate a description of the current law from a discussion of what the law should be. I was part of a panel at the University of California, Berkeley in September in anticipation of the planned Free Speech Week. One of the faculty members on the panel very powerfully said that he thought that the largest problem in our society is white supremacy and that the chancellor should prohibit any hateful speakers from coming on campus no matter what the First Amendment and the law requires. There was resounding applause from the audience. Then in the question and answer period, one of the students spoke eloquently. She said that she feels threatened when there are hateful speakers on campus. She wants the chancellor to stop for her and other students. She wants hateful speakers to be excluded no matter what the First Amendment law requires. Again, there was resounding applause from the audience. Towards the end of the discussion, I spoke up as a panel member, as somebody who teaches and writes about the First Amendment, who's litigated free speech cases. And I said, you need to be clear about what the law is here. If the chancellor were to exclude Milo Yiannopoulos or Ann Coulter or Ben Shapiro, she would get sued. She would lose. When Auburn University attempted to exclude Richard Spencer from speaking, he and his supporters sued, and they won. The campus would be liable to pay the excluded speaker's attorney's fees. Because the law here is so clear, the chancellor might be personally liable for money damages. The excluded speakers would make themselves out to be victims and martyrs. They would get to speak anyway, so nothing would be achieved. No one applauded when I said that. <laughs> and yet that is a description of the current law. And that's what I'd like to do today, is describe for you the current law with regard to free speech on campus. I can summarize it in three basic points. First, all ideas and views can be expressed on a college campus, period. Now, I'm especially speaking of public colleges and universities. The First Amendment applies to these as government institutions. The First Amendment doesn't apply to private institutions. This is something that's often misunderstood about the law. An easy illustration, it's of a true story of a conversation I had with my oldest two children 26 years ago when they were nine and six and we were in a grocery store together. Diet Coke was giving away free baseball cards. Three cards were pictured on the outside of the package. As we went up and down the aisles of the grocery store, my two sons were fighting, as they often did at that age, but who was going to get the extra baseball card? Finally, I said, be quiet. I don't want to hear anything about baseball cards to leave the grocery store. My then nine-year-old turned to me and said, you can't tell me to be quiet. I've got freedom of speech. <laughs> I was ready for him. I said, freedom of speech means the government can't tell you to be quiet. 
I'm not the government, so I can't. <laughs> to which he, without missing a beat, turned to me and said, well, you like the government to me, so you should be able to tell me to be quiet. <laughs> this past fall, I got a call from a reporter from a major newspaper. This was after President Trump said that national football teams should fire players that don't stand for the national anthem. The reporter said to me, wouldn't it violate the First Amendment for a football team to fire a player for not standing for the national anthem? I explained that the First Amendment applies to government institutions. Professional football teams are private, so the Constitution doesn't apply. The reporter said to me, Professor, are you sure? <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Now, this doesn't mean that free speech principles have no application to private universities just because the First Amendment doesn't apply. For example, here in California, there's the Leonard Law, a state statute that says that private universities cannot punish speech that the First Amendment would not allow public universities to punish. Also, faculty and student handbooks often declare the importance of free speech on campus. These have been interpreted by courts to be a contract with faculty and students, respectively. Also, universities, public and private, are committed to academic freedom. Above all, the Supreme Court has said that the First Amendment means that the government cannot punish speech or create liability for speech based on the viewpoint or idea expressed. This is so even if the speech is offensive, even deeply offensive. To give an example, a Supreme Court case from earlier this decade, Snyder versus Phelps. Now, it's a small church out of Topeka, Kansas, the Westboro Baptist Church. They make it a practice of going to funerals of those who died in military service and use them as the occasion for expressing a very vile, anti-gay, anti-lesbian message. Matthew Snyder died as a Marine in military service in Iraq. The members of the Westboro Baptist Church traveled to his funeral in Maryland. Before the service, they asked the police where they could lawfully stand. Officers pointed an area about 1,000 feet away from the service to be conducted. Before the funeral service, they chanted and sang. During it, they held up signs and were silent. That night, Matthew's father, Albert Snyder, was watching the news. He was able to read what was on the signs. He was deeply offended. He sued the members of the Westboro Baptist Church for intentional infliction of emotional distress and invasion of privacy. A jury awarded him $10 million. The United States Supreme Court, eight to one, reversed and ruled in favor of the members of the Westboro Baptist Church. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion for the court emphatically said, the government cannot create liability for speech or punish expression on the grounds that it is offensive. Second principle, free speech is not absolute. There are categories of unprotected speech. We're all familiar with the famous statement from the late Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes that there's no right to falsely shout fire in a crowded theater. This is a way of saying that free speech is never absolute. Since at least 1942, the Supreme Court has said there are categories of unprotected speech where the government can punish the expression. Child pornography is a category of unprotected speech. Not only can the government punish the sale, distribution of child pornography, it even can punish private possession in the home. False and deceptive advertising is a category of unprotected speech. There are three categories of unprotected speech that are relevant to our discussion today of speech on campus. One is incitement of illegal activity. For this and all the categories, it's important to separate the legal test for when speech can be punished from the more colloquial use of the word. There is a legal test that has to be met in order to punish speech as incitement. It comes from a 1969 Supreme Court case Brandenburg versus Ohio. There the Supreme Court said, advocacy can be punished if there's a substantial likelihood of imminent illegal activity and if the speech is directed at causing imminent illegal activity. Let me contrast a couple of examples. Imagine that there's an angry crowd on campus. Imagine that a speaker exhorts that crowd to go commit acts of violence, to break windows, to light buildings on fire. 
Imagine that the speaker is prosecuted for incitement. In the context of my hypothetical, that speech that could be punished because there was a substantial likelihood of imminent illegality and the speech was directed at causing imminent illegal activity. Compare that to another example. Imagine that there's a hateful speaker coming onto campus, Richard Spencer, Milo Yiannopoulos. Imagine that an angry crowd reacts against the speaker. Can the speaker then be punished for incitement? No, it can't be said that the speaker there was advocating that that crowd react against him, that that crowd engage in violence. It reflects a more general principle. We don't allow the reaction of the audience to be a basis for suppressing the speaker. A second category of unprotected speech are what the Supreme Court has referred to as true threats. That phrase comes directly from the Supreme Court. It comes from a case in the mid-1960s, United States versus Watts, involved a federal statute that makes it a federal crime to threaten the President of the United States. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of that law. But the court said it's important to draw a distinction between mere hyperbole and a true threat. The Supreme Court hasn't given us much clarification yet as to when does speech rise to the level of a true threat. The lower courts, in fact, are split on this issue. I think the better approach is to say there's no First Amendment right to cause a person to reasonably fear for imminent danger to his or her physical safety. Again, I would contrast two examples. Imagine there's a student walking across campus, and imagine an angry group surrounds that student. They yell at the student in a way that causes the student to fear that he or she is going to be beaten. Even if no blows are struck there, the speakers can be punished. That's a true threat. Compare that to another example. At Berkeley, in late September, I heard many students say that they felt threatened by the mere presence of racist speakers on campus. I understand that it was enormously upsetting to them, but no court would find that the presence of a speaker in the middle of campus by itself, without more, amount to a true threat, speech that could be punished consistent with the First Amendment. A third category of unprotected speech is harassment. There's relatively little law about when speech rises to the level of harassment on campus that can be punished. But there's a good deal of law in the context of the workplace. Take the easiest example. Imagine that an employer says to an employee, sleep with me or you're fired. It would be no defense for the employer to say it was just speech, just words. The courts are also clear that there can be liability for harassment if it's a hostile work environment. Generally, this requires that the speech be directed at a person or be sufficiently pervasive as to materially interfere with education, employment opportunities on the basis of race, sex, religion, sexual orientation. I think the same standard can be applied to educational institutions. The speech would need to be directed or be sufficiently pervasive to materially interfere with educational opportunities based on a race, sex, religion, sex orientation. Let me again compare a couple of examples. There was an incident at the University of California, San Diego, where somebody put in the library what appeared to be a noose. There was an incident at Duke University where someone draped over a tree branch what appeared to be a noose. That by itself would not be enough for harassment. It's vile, but it's not directed at anyone. It's not pervasive. However, imagine a situation that someone tacked under the door in a dormitory of a room occupied by an African-American student would appear to be a noose. No doubt that would be regarded as harassment, likely also regarded as a true threat. There's certainly line drawing issues in terms of when speech crosses the line to harassment, not protected by the First Amendment, or becomes a true threat, or becomes incitement. But those are the basic categories long outlined by the Supreme Court that are relevant to our discussion today. You'll notice the category that I didn't mention is being unprotected, and that's hate speech. That's because generally hateful speech is safeguarded by the First Amendment. So many people have asked me the question, 
What's the line between free speech and hate speech? But the question presumes a false distinction. Hate speech generally is free speech. You probably remember an incident in the late 1970s and early 1980s where the Nazi party wanted to hold a demonstration in Skokie, Illinois. Skokie is a suburb just north of Chicago. It was then predominantly Jewish with a large number of Holocaust survivors. That's why the Nazi party chose it for its demonstration. Skokie did everything it could to exclude the Nazi party. But every court, including the United States Supreme Court, ruled that the Nazis had the right to march through Skokie. There's a Supreme Court case in 1992, RAV versus City of St. Paul. After a series of racist incidents, St. Paul, Minnesota adopted an ordinance prohibiting burning a cross or painting a swastika in a manner likely to anger, alarm, or cause resentment. The Supreme Court unanimously declared that ordinance unconstitutional. These are vile symbols of hate, but they're speech protected by the First Amendment. Another example, Virginia, in light of its racist history, adopted a state law prohibiting cross burning. In Virginia versus Black in 2003, the Supreme Court declared that law unconstitutional, except in instances where it amount to a true threat. In the early 1990s, over 350 colleges and universities adopted hate speech codes. Every one to be considered by a court, without exception, was declared unconstitutional. Why is this? Most European countries prohibit hate speech. They make it a crime. Why do we tolerate it in the United States? In part, I think, it's because of the inability to define what's hate speech in a manner that's not unduly vague or overbroad. Any law regulating speech, any campus regulation of speech, has to be clear about what's prohibited and what's permitted. It can't regulate more speech than is necessary to achieve its objective. Let me give you some examples. After a series of ugly incidents, the University of Michigan adopted a hate speech code. It prohibited speech that stigmatized or demeaned on the basis of race, sex, religion, sex orientation. It took that language from European laws forbidding hate speech. But what does it mean to say that speech stigmatizes or demeans on the basis of race, sex, religion, sex orientation? A lawsuit was brought by a sociobiology graduate student. He said his research was about whether there are inherent behavioral differences between men and women. He was afraid that the outcomes of his studies might run afoul of the hate speech code. Federal district court declared it unconstitutional on vagueness grounds. Also, the experience under these hate speech codes, as well as under European laws, should cause us pause before embracing them. At the University of Michigan, after the hate speech code was enacted, before it was struck down, every enforcement action under it, without exception, was brought against African American and Latino students. When England adopted its first hate speech law, the initial prosecution under it was brought against a Zionist group, the prosecutor saying that Zionism should be regarded as a form of racism. France has a strict hate speech law, one of the most frequently prosecuted individuals under it is the actress Bridget Bardot. She's an animal rights activist, and she sharply criticizes religions that engage in sacrifice of animals. And each time she does so, an indictment and prosecution has begun against her. Perhaps most of all, though, hate speech is protected in this country because it expresses an idea. It's a vile idea, but it's an idea nonetheless. And under the First Amendment, all ideas and views can be expressed. The late Justice John Marshall Harlan said, to censor words is to censor ideas. We can't cleanse the English language to please the most squeamish among us. Third and final principle. Colleges and universities can use time, place, and manner restrictions with regard to speech, so long as they leave open adequate alternative places for communication. Even when there's a right to use government property for speech, it doesn't mean that it has to be available at any time, any place, in any manner. Colleges and universities can use time, place, and manner restrictions 
especially to prevent disruption of campus activities and to ensure safety on campus. In terms of the former, a college certainly could have a rule that says there could be no demonstrations or protests in or near classroom buildings while classes are in session. Campuses can have free speech zones so long as they're of adequate size, so long as they sufficiently allow space for communication for protest. Likewise, colleges and universities can use time, place, and manner restrictions to ensure safety on campus. Colleges have a legal and an ethical duty to ensure the safety of students, staff, and faculty. Last summer, when I arrived at UC Berkeley, the Chancellor Carol Christ was kind enough to ask my advice in terms of handling the coming Free Speech Week and protests that were planned for the Berkeley campus. My advice was that when it comes to the most controversial speakers, the campus should make sure that they're speaking in an auditorium rather than an open area of campus. I said, if the speaker is in an auditorium, you can require identification or tickets. If necessary, you can have metal detectors. Police can secure the perimeter. I said, if the speaker is in the open area of campus, at Berkeley on Sproul Plaza, there's no ability to do those things. Having a speaker be in an auditorium rather than an open area seems to me a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction. So when the college Republicans invited Ben Shapiro to speak in September, he was allowed to address the community in the largest auditorium on campus, Zollerbach Hall, rather than from the middle of campus. I think one of the hardest issues, the law provides no answer to this point, is how much does a campus have to spend in order to ensure security? What's the point at which a campus can say, we just can't afford the security costs, and since we can't provide safety for students, staff, and faculty, we're going to exclude the speaker? Chancellor Christ was kind enough to ask me this question as well, and I had to explain here, the law just isn't settled. It's clear that you can't charge a student group so much as to effectively keep the speaker from being able to appear. The campus couldn't say to college Republicans, you want to invite Ben Shapiro, you have to pay the $600,000 security cost. That would violate the First Amendment. And yet there has to be a point at which a campus can say it's just too expensive. The University of California, Berkeley spent $3.9 million on security for speakers in the month of September 2017. That's, of course, money that's coming from the educational mission of the campus. What if conservatives planned, could have been liberals as well in this instance it was conservatives, not a free speech week, but a free speech semester? And what if the cost was not $4 million, but $50 million? Where is the point at which the campus can say, we just can't afford the security costs. I told Chancellor Chris that there is no law in this regard to this point. I said, not campus counsel, she has her lawyer. But if I were her lawyer, I would tell her she would need to think about two questions. First, what's her stomach for being sued? I said, the law is sufficiently uncertain here. If you exclude a speaker on the basis of cost, you are going to get sued. And no one can predict what the outcome will be because the law is unsettled. If you lose, you're going to have to pay attorney's fees. So the other question is, what do you want your message to be at this point in time? I think she quite wisely decided she wanted her message to be that Berkeley is a free speech campus and absorb the costs. But as I look at what's going on at so many other universities across the country, I realize that this is a question that courts are going to need to resolve and resolve quickly. So I've described for you the basic principles of free speech on campus. But I also want to talk about the importance of campuses being an inclusive learning environment for all students. Campuses have the obligation to protect not just the safety, but the educational attainment of all of their students, as well as, of course, to protect staff and faculty. It can't come, though, through suppression of speech. But there's so many things that campuses can do without infringing speech so as to create an inclusive learning environment. I think it's important for campuses to have principles of community that describe the kinds of expression that are desired and those that are regarded as undesirable. The principles of community aren't enforced by discipline. No one's punished. 
but it does send a message to the kind of place when our campus is to be. When there are ugly incidents on campus, I think it's essential that campus administrators speak out against them. When I was a professor at the University of Southern California, somebody wrote a very homophobic slur on a board. That afternoon, the dean had a letter placed in every student, staff, and faculty mailbox. That shows you how long ago it was. <laughs> Decrying the homophobic incident and explaining why it's inconsistent with the community that we desire to be. When the swastika was drawn over Alan Dershowitz's picture at UC Berkeley Law School, I learned about it at 4 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. At 8 o'clock on Thursday morning, I sent a note to every faculty member, staff member, and student decrying this, condemning the hate speech, and explaining why it's inconsistent with our community. It was Olive Wendell Holmes who also said the best remedy for the speech we don't like is more speech. I'm not naive. I know that more speech cannot erase the hurt and the pain of hateful speech. I in no way diminish the hurt and the pain that it causes. But I do think it's important in terms of establishing the type of college community that we want to be. I think it's important for administrators and faculty to help guide students in having counter protests when there's hateful speakers. When Richard Spencer spoke at Texas A&M University, they organized a counter protest in the large football stadium there. Tens of thousands of faculty, staff, and students came. What could have been a divisive moment for the campus was a unifying one. I encourage students, both undergraduate and the law school, to hold teach-ins during the planned free speech week to have leafleting, to have picketing, but also to have opportunities for education. So there's so much that can and must be done without it being a restriction of speech. Now, I have talked very much about what the law is. I haven't described much my views about what the law should be. Ultimately, I believe that the question that has to be faced is, are we better off allowing campus officials to pick and choose what speech to allow, or are we better off allowing speech to occur? I don't have very much trust in campus or government officials. And so I believe that we're better off allowing speech to occur. I know that the only way that our free speech rights can be secure tomorrow is to protect the speech that we detest today. Long been said that we don't need free speech for the speech we like. We let that go in anyway. We need free speech for the speech that we detest. Ultimately, the First Amendment is based on a faith, a faith that we're better off as a society letting all ideas and views be expressed than giving the government the power to censor some. I share that faith, at least most of the time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Erwin. I think uh, uh, a few years ago, National Jurist Magazine uh, had an article in which they said there are 23 law professors you must take before you die. Uh, the first one mentioned was Erwin Chermitsky. Uh, I think you saw it today uh, uh, why that was important. You're so generous. Thank you. I, I teach econometrics in the law, so I'm not on that list usually. <laughs> uh, but uh, Erwin, th thanks so much. Uh, there's one issue that um, uh, has come up in recent years because of the proliferation of guns on campuses around the country. And we saw in Charlottesville, of course, not on the campus, but uh, in the city itself, guns at the protest uh, in the Charlottesville rally. Uh, can you comment a little bit about your thinking about how guns might change the nature of the debate about free speech? There is no constitutional right to have a gun or a weapon at a college campus demonstration protest. People don't bring guns and weapons to engage in civilized discourse. Now, there's so much misunderstanding about the Second Amendment. It would really be a topic for another program. But the only Supreme Court case that's ever established a Second Amendment right said that it's about the right to have guns in one's home for the sake of security. No Supreme Court decision has ever said there's a right to have guns out in public. And of course, even if there were such a right, there can still be restrictions of guns and I think campuses can restrict guns from being on campus. I think campuses can restrict guns from being at protests and demonstrations. That's why I think when there is a controversial speaker, 
metal detectors may not only be desirable, but even necessary to protect everyone. Thank you. Uh, in a moment, we'll turn to the audience for some questions. I just had one uh, ad additional question. In recent campaigns, we've seen uh, much uh, completely inaccurate and false statements made about political candidates. Uh, can you say anything about New York Times versus sure. Sullivan and the ability to use the law to try to attack uh, erroneous speech directed at public officials? Sure. There are times where the law can punish false speech. Think of perjury. Lying in court under oath can be punished. Somebody who does it is not going to win by saying, well, it was just speech under the First Amendment. False and deceptive advertising, I mentioned, can be punished. But in the realm of political speech, it's very difficult to punish. Um, and I would mention two cases. One, the most important, you talk about New York Times versus Sullivan from 1964. That was a defamation action brought against the New York Times for publishing an ad that had minor factual inaccuracies with regard to civil rights protests. And the Supreme Court held that the New York Times could not be held liable. And the Supreme Court, in an opinion by Justice Brennan, very eloquently said, that in order for free speech to thrive, maybe even to survive, it needs breathing space. And there has to be protection of false speech. There was a more recent Supreme Court case, United States versus Alvarez. It involves a federal law called the Federal Stolen Valor Act. It makes a federal crime for a person to falsely claim to have received military honors. A man in Riverside, California, at a public meeting, claimed to have won the Congressional Medal of Honor. He didn't. He got convicted under the statute. The Supreme Court declared that law unconstitutional. Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court and very emphatically said, false speech is protected by the First Amendment. We could talk about when can there still be liability for defamation. But the bottom line is, we believe that when it comes to political speech, the best remedy for false speech is true speech. If there's fake news, answer it with true news. Don't have the government decide what's true and what's false. OK, questions from our audience. Uh, Lenores. Uh, thank you, Dean. Um, one movement that began on campus, a campus, Stanford campus, is the recall of Judge Aaron Persky. And there's been a lot of speech, a lot uh, of, in favor of the recall, and a lot from those of us who oppose the recall as a real threat to the independence of the judiciary. What is your view on the recall and the speech aspect? I think that judicial independence is the very heart of the rule of law. Judges should decide cases on their best view of the law and the facts, not to please the voters. I am very concerned about the recall of Judge Persky because if he is removed from office because of his sentence in one case, then what message is that going to send to judges throughout the state? They then will feel that if they are regarded as too lenient, they're then going to face recall as well. There's not been a successful recall in California of a judge since 1932. Every judge in the state of California is paying very close attention to this. The late Justice Otto Kaus, who served on the California Supreme Court, said that generally, judicial elections are for judges like having a crocodile in their bathtubs. They're always aware they're there. I think if Judge Persky is recalled, every judge is going to feel there's a very large crocodile that's going to affect how judges decide cases. I am also concerned about the speech aspect of this. A number of things have been said about the supporters of the recall that are untrue or that are misleading. For example, in the support for the petition for the recall, it said that the University of California, Berkeley, California Center on Constitutional Law, it found that recalls are no threat to judicial independence. It never said that. Its report was nothing other than a description of the past instances in which recalls had been used. As you can tell, I am strongly opposed to the recall. I have written a couple of op-eds to that effect. And yet, a statement from one of them is taken out of context by supporters of the recall in a way that makes it appear that I'm supporting it. Let's have an honest debate about this, but let's have it with true and accurate speech.
Uh, I was interested to know if you could talk about uh, a threat. Is a threat a perception? So um, uh, if, if someone is uh, Charlottesville carrying these ugly signs and uh, somebody is, is feeling really threatened by those signs and the sign maker says, oh, it's only a joke. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I'd like to rip those signs up. And to me, it's more than a perception. It, it's real. So if you could talk about that, and I don't know if I made myself sure. clear, but I, 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 I wonder. I mentioned in passing that the lower courts are split in terms of what's the legal definition for to be a true threat. Some lower courts have said you have to prove that the speaker desired to threaten another. Others are saying you only have to prove that the person reasonably feared for imminent harm to his or her physical safety. I choose the latter, which I think is more protective of people, not requiring proof that the person desired to cause the harm. This issue was before the Supreme Court a few years ago, though the court didn't resolve the constitutional question. It was a case called Alonis versus United States. Anthony Douglas Alonis and his wife, Tara Alonis, went through a very bitter divorce. She was given custody of the two children. He began posting angry messages on Facebook. She was so afraid, she went to the judge who had issued the divorce and got him to grant a restraining order to keep him from posting such things. This is so often in such situations, it had no effect. In fact, it caused him to post even angrier messages. At one point, he posted on Facebook that he was going to go to a local kindergarten class and commit an act of unprecedented violence. It was only a question of which class. He was convicted of making a threat in interstate commerce. The Supreme Court, 8 to 1, overturned his conviction. The Supreme Court said that in order to convict him under the federal statute, you have to show that he desired to cause people to feel threatened, not just they felt threatened. But the question for the First Amendment is, is it enough to show that a person reasonably feared for his or her physical safety? I think that should be the standard. Uh, yes. This involves access. This involves access in that there are private spaces that are, in fact, public spaces. And there's a classic case right here at the Prune Yard Shopping Center in San Jose, in which students who were soliciting political activity were asked to leave. And this was declared unconstitutional. What's the follow-up on that? It's a little bit more complicated. Under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, there's no right to use privately owned shopping centers for speech purposes. But the California Supreme Court, in the case you allude to, Prune Yard Shopping Centers versus Robbins, said that under the California Constitution, and under the California Constitution's right to free speech, there's a right to use private shopping centers for speech purposes. So it's important to distinguish the source of law here. It's not under the US Constitution, but there is such a right under the California Constitution. Uh, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Several uh, European countries have declared Holocaust denial as uh, being uh, above as being illegal. What's your feeling about that? I think the best is to allow people to express that false and horrific idea and let it be responded to. That if people want to deny the existence of the Holocaust, <coughs> there is so much evidence of every possible sort to prove that it occurred. Let that then be the response. I think if you suppress it from being sad, it only will go underground and gain more currency, whereas if you expose it, this is something that can be so clearly be shown to be false. Holocaust deniers have been able to say it, but they haven't been able to gain following because the falsity of what they're saying can be so easily shown. If there's any place where the so-called marketplace of ideas has worked, where the response of more speech has succeeded, this is one of them. Erwin, one area that we see in the rise of Facebook is that individuals 
just seek out the messages that uh, reinforce their own opinions, and sometimes it's uh, being reinforced by false information. Uh, you mentioned the difference between the restrictions uh, imposed by government and by private entities. Could Facebook do more to police, uh, you know, inaccurate statements, and should they do so? Facebook is a private entity. It's not covered by the First Amendment. Google is a private entity. It's not covered by the First Amendment. I'm concerned about how much power these private entities can exercise over the speech we receive. If Google won't allow access to a particular website, it's really as if that website doesn't exist at all. So in terms of the current law, Facebook can monitor and exclude hate speech. Facebook can monitor and exclude anything that it wants. Whether we want to have more regulation of companies like Facebook and Google is a different question and one that I find very difficult. Um, it, it really troubles me how much power these private companies are going to have over the expression that occurs in the United States. Other questions? Uh, yes. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned that the hate speech is protected by First Amendment, but in California we have hate crimes that clearly are crimes by definition. What is the distinction between something that's hateful speech and potentially speech that would cross over to become a crime? The key difference is it is criminal activity apart from the speech. Beating somebody up is criminal activity apart from the speech. If it's proven that it's hate motivated, there can be a greater punishment for it. And the United States Supreme Court in Wisconsin versus Mitchell in 1993 said that it doesn't violate the First Amendment to have greater punishments for hate motivated crimes because the punishment is for the criminal activity itself, not for the speech. Okay. I want to go back to your. I want to go back to your question about, uh, or your comment about Facebook a second ago, where you're concerned about the, about the amount of power they have. Um, take it to the example of, quote, fake news and their desire now to try and identify fake news. If I follow your line of argument, then they wouldn't provide filters and fake, fake news, if you'll take that term, uh, would be up to the user to figure out. And might that, in fact, be uh, against the best interests of the government to, or uh, of society? It's a great question, as was John's. I think that the internet and social media are the most powerful tools for communication to develop since the printing press. They have so democratized the ability to reach a mass audience. It used to be that in order to reach a large number of people, you had to be rich enough to own a newspaper or to get a broadcast license. Now, anybody with a smartphone can reach a mass audience. And you don't even need that. If you can go to a library, but there's a motive. This has great benefits, but it has real costs. I think the hardest issues of free speech that are going to come up for college universities involve the internet and social media. I began by saying our image of speech is what goes on on campus. The on-campus, off-campus distinction doesn't matter when you're dealing with internet and social media. It can be used to harass. It can be used to reveal very private information about things. The question is, to what extent do we want to have private companies like Facebook and Google serve as gatekeepers. On the one hand, when you talk about weeding out fake news, stopping racist speech, I'm attracted to that. But why should I have more confidence in those who run Facebook and Google than those who run government? Um, maybe right now they may seem <laughs> benevolent, but I worry about that. And that's what I said in response to John's question about being concerned about the tremendous power that these private companies can exercise over the information that we receive. Uh, one second. One question that was given to me in sure. advance from the audience uh, uh, referred to one of your uh, University of California colleagues, John Powell. Um, yes. Could you articulate his views on free speech and whether uh, it's, it's being used uh, or restraints on it are being used to uh, protect or restrict the interests of those less powerful, et cetera? I actually alluded to John Powell without mentioning his name when I was talking about the event that occurred on the Berkeley campus in September. 
he, as I said, very powerfully talked about how white supremacy is the largest problem in society. And he believes that there should be able to be restrictions on hate speech. Um, and there are other scholars who have taken this position. Richard Delgado, Charles Lawrence, Mari Matsuda have all also said that they believe that we shouldn't be tolerating hate speech and that they think the law should be changed. John Powell at this panel said, the fact that the law is this way doesn't mean that it can't be changed. And I think he would urge the University of California, Berkeley, to be at the forefront of trying to move the law in the direction of more restriction of hate speech. I don't think that change in law is going to happen in the foreseeable future. And also, I'm skeptical that it should happen. I'm so worried about giving campus officials the ability to say, this is the speech we're going to allow, and this is the speech that we're going to prohibit. Every time we've gone down that path, we realize in hindsight it was a huge mistake. I'd like to follow up on the discussion that we've had about Facebook and Google and promoting um, better speech as opposed to restricting speech that is characterized by people shouting at each other. What I'm wondering is have you seen evidence uh, in the literature and in universities of opportunities for people to have more engaged speech with each other? And are there things that organizations like Google, Facebook, universities, the League of Women Voters, and numerous others to promote better speech? I would like to see campuses do much more to model what you say is better speech. I would like to see there on every campus be a series of debates. And to me, it almost doesn't matter what the topics are. But people who we know will be respectful to one another, who will disagree, but without being disagreeable. Because I think that one way in which we can serve our students is by modeling that kind of discourse. I think all too often on campuses now, you'll have speakers of particular viewpoints, even extremist speakers, and then maybe a reaction against that speaker. But you don't have structured debates. And, and I think that could be something very good for campuses to do, um, very good to have more in our society. Uh, yes. I'm interested in Citizens United 2010, that money is free speech. And do you agree? And if you don't agree, what do you suggest we do about it since we now have auctions, not elections? Thank you. <laughs> I think Citizens United will be regarded as one of the most tragically wrong Supreme Court cases in history, and there are many that deserve that title. As, um, you know, in Citizens United, the Supreme Court held that corporations have the right to spend unlimited amounts of money to get candidates elected or defeated. Citizens United was not the first case to say that spending money in elections is speech. That actually was Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976. I disagree with that. I think spending money in an election campaign is a form of conduct that communicates a message, but it's not speech itself. And that matters in terms of First Amendment law. We all know the expression, money talks. But to say that money is speech really takes a figurative expression <laughs> to literally. Uh, beyond that, I think even if I were to concede that spending money is speech, I think there's a compelling government interest in preventing the corruption and appearance of corruption that comes when there's large expenditures. I also think that the government has a compelling interest in equalizing influence in the political system. What's notable is just seven years before Citizens United, in McConnell versus Federal Election Commission, the Supreme Court five to four upheld the same provisions it struck down in Citizens United. The Supreme Court said just what I did to you, that there's a compelling interest in any corruption, the appearance of corruption, compelling interest in equalizing influence in the political system. Citizens United overrules McConnell. What happened in those just seven years? Did the court find some musty history of the First Amendment that led it to believe it made a mistake? No, the difference was that Sandra Day O'Connor, who was in the majority in McConnell, was replaced by Samuel Alito, who was the fifth vote to overrule McConnell. Um, I don't worry about the effect of Citizens United in presidential elections. The quantity of money is so vast there, I don't think a single corporation would make a difference. I worry much more for the low visibility elections, the local elections, even sometimes the congressional seat, where who spends money really can determine the outcome. 
And I worry, too, about something we'll never be able to measure. How many candidates choose not to run because they're worried about the corporate wealth that'll be arrayed against them? We just have a couple of minutes left, sure. Erwin. I was going to ask about the fairness doctrine, but uh, if you want to speak about that or sure. just uh, wrap up in any way, uh, we'd be interested in your final thoughts. Sure. I want to go back to where I started. These issues aren't new. They're coming up in a different context now, but I think we can take long-established principles of free speech and deal with so many of them, starting with what I said. All ideas and views can be expressed at campus. To me, that's the very core of what academic freedom is about. To me, it's the very core of what freedom of speech has to be about. It means that at times, we're going to be uncomfortable with said. We might be offended. We might be hurt. But that's the cost of free speech. And I think to reject that and go down a different path is quite dangerous. Um, well, thank you. L let me just uh, end by asking, do you think uh, the discourse on, on TV today is better because we eliminated the Fairness Doctrine or worse? I don't know that the discourse could be worse than it is right now. <laughs> um, through so much of the 20th century, the shared media brought our society together and broke down regional differences. Movies, radio, and ultimately television. We all watched Walter Cronkite and Huntley Brinkley. Now, instead of it being unifying, I think that the media is so dividing us. We watch that which just reinforces our existing beliefs. And it's often more vitriol than it is ideas or inspiration. I don't know how much it ties to the fairness doctrine, but I think it's a huge problem. And I think polarization, which this is contributing to, is an enormous threat to our democratic system. Please join me in thanking everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're so, so, so kind. <laughs> So over the generations, it's sweet. Thank you.